if you are suffering from depression or anxiety or other mental health issues or somebody that you know and love is experiencing problems like this and you'd like to know how to handle it naturally, you clicked on the right video. Hi, I'm Dr. Corey Stern and welcome to my channel, Take Control of Your Health. If you haven't yet had a chance to subscribe, please hit the subscribe button now as that is my reward for getting this information out to you. If you like the video, don't forget to hit the like button because it does help more people to find the information. And last and most importantly, please share this with anyone you know that you think would benefit from the information. So I am absolutely delighted to have on a special guest today. And this is Dr. Alice Lee. She is a holistic psychiatrist. And in my years of clinical experience, I've had a lot of trouble finding psychiatrists that share her holistic and natural viewpoint. So I, I feel so grateful to have met her and uh, for hers, her to agree to be on my show today. And Dr. Lee, thank you for giving up your time. I know you have a very busy schedule. Please um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Well, thank you so much for having me um, on your podcast. I really, really appreciate the, your, your dedication to your patients and helping them through your YouTube channel. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a psychiatrist by training. So my training was both adult psychiatry for four years. And then I went on to training child and adolescent psychiatry at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. for another two years. Um, but I practiced as a conventional psychiatrist for another eight years before I fully started to go down the path um, and started to learn more about other tools that I can integrate into my private private practice at the time. So um, that was in 2002 when I first started learning more about nutrition's role and how we can use nutrition to help people with mental health. I was really awestruck by this powerful tool that we weren't taught in medical school or in in all the years and it took me a whole 10 years to get through every all my training I've never really learned about how nutrition can have such a huge impact on mental health and I was blown away loved it and then in 2003 uh, I ran across somebody who uh, taught me energy medicine starting with a very uh, popular now technique called emotional freedom technique, or some people call it tapping technique. From there, I learned about how to do some energy testing um, and started muscle testing patients, but then learned how to muscle test myself in order to get the same information for my patients. I really felt that my uh, perspective on patient care was much more aligned with the holistic integrative approach. I just didn't know that I had that option when I started in medicine. Um, but I am glad that I went through the training because it allows me as a medical doctor to prescribe medications, which is a real key, <laughs> it's a real key component to being able to lower medications gradually and safely. Yes, agreed. Because I've seen people do it the wrong way and it's a disaster. Yeah, and now, so with the three different fields, <clears throat> with the three different fields integrated together, I've really made it my mission to try to help patients to either avoid medications or to be able to come off their medications as naturally and safely as possible. Um, last year, I published a journal article on helping someone get off six psychiatric med medications in about a year with no withdrawals and she did well and it's now probably off our medications for about two and a half to three years now so oh, that's amazing yeah because i have a lot of patients that struggle to get off one so six is yeah yeah that's and mm -hmm. she was on you know before she came to see me she was on already 30 supplements she was followed by a functional doctor who treated her uh, to prevent breast cancer relapse. Um, she was doing a lot of things to help her health, but it was during that period of time that she got mentally ill and had two uh, residential treatment 
uh, center um, admissions, five other hospitalizations, um, and she had psychotherapy twice a week. Um, she had made one suicide attempt. So she had, you know, used her resources to find the best kind of conventional care, as well as kind of the orthomolecular and functional medicine care. And she couldn't get off her medication. In fact, she got sick during that time when she was on all of those medications. So I think the key was the energy medicine piece um, that helped her to get over the hump and be able to get better. Um, so I think the integration of three fields, like energy medicine, functional medicine, and psychiatry really makes a big difference when it comes to medication withdrawal. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. That's what I like to do. So now that you brought up the topic of medications, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about medication and what types of medications are generally prescribed for conditions like depression. Um, a lot of them are called SSRIs. Can you talk to us a little bit about what those are and how they work um, and name a few of the most common ones that people are put on? Sure. The SSRIs are very common. They're almost handed out like candy. <laughs> you know, if you come into a family physician and you're feeling worried or anxious, um, especially medication, well, medications are the main tool for a lot of doctors when it comes to any kind of mental health complaint. So they just want to help. And so they aren't aware that there are problems with these medications. So they just hand out the SSRIs. But the SSRIs stand for Selective Serotonin Reuptake, Reuptake Inhibitors. Uh, they are usually used for depression and anxiety. Um, so they work on the serotonin system. Serotonin gets converted to melatonin. So the two, serotonin and melatonin, are very um, interconnected. Um, but serotonin, uh, you know, according to conventional psychiatrists, is really the key to, you know, helping with depression and anxiety. Some of the medications are like, the early ones were like, Prozac, Zoloft, they went on to create Celexa, uh, Lexapro, you know, all of these are SSRIs and then evolved into SNRIs, that's a ser select, uh, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and those are Effexor and Cymbalta and those kind of medications. So all of these medications um, came about because before that generation, a lot of the antidepressants um, if you were to overdose it on, on them, uh, the tricyclics, um, they're very dangerous in terms of overdoses. And so the SSRIs took over because if you were try to, if you were to try to overdose on, you know, SSRIs, they won't kill you. Okay. So, um, what I learned in holistic medicine that I think, I hope everybody will find interesting is that 90 to 95% of the serotonin system actually works in our GI system, the gastrointestinal system. And I didn't know that. I thought it was some kind of a brain kind of thing. It, of course, it's in the brain and it gets converted to melatonin in our brain. But um, but just imagine where that medication is actually helping the most. It's really helping the, in the gut the most because you, you swallow a pill, it's gonna work in the gut first and then it gets you know distributed throughout the body. So, the one thing I think that people need to understand about SSRIs is that it doesn't increase serotonin. You know, it doesn't increase the amount of serotonin. And in fact, over the course of my training as a holistic and integrative psychiatrist, what I've learned is that it actually depletes your serotonin storage levels so that you become less able to handle stress if you were to stop this medication. And quite significantly, like 80% you know, lower in terms of the uh, platelets, storage levels of serotonin and within two weeks, you know, so it's not something that happens, you know, in a year or, you know, just a little bit, but it significantly, you know, depletes your storage levels of serotonin. So in holistic medicine, instead of using a medication that kind of um, blocks a reuptake of serotonin, which is the recycling of the serotonin that you just made, um, in holistic and integrative medicine, if you want to support the serotonin system, it's easily done. You just take some, you know, vitamins and minerals and some 5-HTP, 5 5-HTP, 
which is the activated form of L-tryptophan, which is an amino acid. And there you go. You can start making lo lots of serotonin if that's what you want. Um, but the reason why I say if that's what you want is that serotonin, the serotonin hypothesis has been debunked by a lot of researchers that this is not the underlying cause of depression and anxiety. And therefore, you know, improving the serotonin system by building more serotonin, which can be easily done, can help your gut, but it may not heal underlying causes. So yeah, that's SSRIs in a nutshell. So essentially, what we're saying here is that it almost masks the symptoms of depression and anxiety by um, increasing serotonin artificially, and then you're kind of stuck on it because it, when you stop it, your serotonin levels go down and you end up feeling worse. And it's never getting to the root cause as to what the anxiety and depression, where, where it started to begin with, which I do want to get into that because I actually have a lot of videos on that topic too. It is such a rampant issue right now. Um, it has been for a long time. For me, at least in, in my patient base, it's getting more prevalent. I'm seeing more and more people uh, with symptoms of depression. And I say symptoms because to me, depression and anxiety are symptoms of imbalances and deficiencies in the body. But more and more individuals complaining about it and younger and younger. I have you know, young children coming in with anxiety. I have right now I have um, an 11 year old with severe anxiety. So as a patient, well, what's so important, yeah, think, um, when you say, you know, it covers up the underlying causes, it reminds me of a very important um, thing that I discovered, as I started to work in this field of medication withdrawal. And that is, a lot of people uh, go to their doctor for an SSRI or some anxiolytic or something for depression, when they're undergoing trauma or stress. And then what happens to my surprise is that as I'm helping them off this medication, I'm taking care of the withdrawal symptoms, but guess what? The old traumas and the old issues suddenly become relevant again. And people are dealing with old issues again. Let's say um, I, I worked with someone coming off an SSRI and she had had a really horrible time during a divorce. And so when we were coming off the medication, she actually had to talk more about the divorce again. So it's not just a physiological thing. It actually happens at the emotional, psychological trauma level uh, that these medications kind of somehow just make it less relevant for you to deal with it. You're kind of frozen in terms of your processing of those issues. And then when you remove the medication, all of a sudden it's like you wake up it says, oh, this really bothered me at this time, and I'm going to do something about it. There are so many things in our daily lives that allow us to avoid processing emotion and trauma. Um, medications are one of them. Um, social media, just, just being on, immersing yourself in a device uh, to not deal with what's going on around you. So I think that's a big part of the issue. And one of the things I'm glad that you brought it up because one of the conversations that I have with patients when they st first tell me when they report depression or anxiety and I dig into it a little bit, I, I say, are you depressed or is there something going on in your life that's upsetting you? Are you anxious or is there something happening that's you know nerve wracking that is a normal response to um, life to, to life events. And a lot of people don't realize the difference. So depression and anxiety, we should actually define chronic depression and anxiety, right? For me, it's when you, let's say depression is when you have a loss of interest in life for, for no particular reason that you can, that you can identify or you feel sad for no you you feel sad all the time for no particular reason that you're able to identify. Now that doesn't mean there might not be a reason, but you you are not 
aware of what it is. And same thing with anxiety. I feel very nervous and worried and um, upset about life, but I can't put my finger on the reason. I just have this feeling all the time. Um, what about you? How do you define them? Well, I have a little bit of a different definition of depression. I think that depression, if you can look at the core of it, um, might be a set of symptoms, like as a convention, I'm thinking as a conventional psychiatrist, okay? Mm -hmm. like it would be at the core of it where you can't help yourself get better. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, people will say, why don't you take a walk? Why don't you talk to your friends? Why don't you go out to a restaurant, have a good meal, cheer yourself up, you know, bring yourself, you know, back up to where you are. If you can do that, and if you can talk to a therapist and relieve some of the problems with processing the problem, to me, that's not something that a conventional psychiatrist should be treating, okay? But if you're in bed, you don't wanna to talk to anyone, you don't wanna eat, can't sleep, and your health is kind of deteriorating because you're kind of powerless in the face of whatever is happening, then I would imagine that it's an appropriate time for a conventional psychiatrist to prescribe some medication because that's all the tools that they have. Um, I think though, uh, you know, depression and any um, any of the diagnoses in psychiatry, they're all just symptom-based. They're just how you feel. And I think one of the problems with that is that you don't really dig any deeper to look for underlying causes. And once you get into that mindset where you don't really care about underlying causes and all you're looking at is a set of symptoms, most conventional psychiatrists really don't explore um, underlying causes they look at the symptoms and you fit those criteria, they will give you a medication because what are they going to do? They're going to say, oh, you're depressed, but I'm going to refer you to so-and-so who's a therapist. No, they're not going to do that because it's going to undermine their income, right? Um, well, a lot of doctors don't do it. Some really good doctors might, but the majority of them uh, will help you based upon their training. So you, if you, the only thing you have is a hammer, Somebody comes in, they're going to treat you as a nail. And therefore, when you say, you know, your approach, which is to ask about, is this a normal response to stress? I would say that a lot of conventional psychiatrists really don't care about what the underlying causes are, because I have seen so many patients get put on SSRIs for very little reason. And um, they're not... They're just trying to take care of discomfort. You know, if you're uncomfortable, they have a pill for it. And they don't really, and, and a lot of patients don't really care either. Like they may have a normal response to stress and they're uncomfortable. Well, they go to a doctor and they don't care if it's a normal response to their stress. They just don't want to feel uncomfortable. So they'll take a medication. So there's like different groups of people and doctors who really don't understand the price that they're paying for that pill. They think of it as a quick fix. When the trouble's over, I'll just stop taking the medication. Everything would be back to normal, but that's not really what happened. And that brings us to the next topic that I want to talk about. And I just also want to say that we are programmed for quick fixes in our current society and there are many people that would just rather take a pill for anything going wrong not just um, uh, mental health but but physical health as well and pain and and all of it comes with a price tag because there's no such thing as a drug without a side effect so the next thing i want to talk to you about is the difficulty that people have getting off these medications I've seen some real horrific um, uh, cases where people felt so horrible coming off drugs that they they went back on them. And you know what? I'll I'll be honest. I I was one of them back before I knew any of this. I was on an SNRI, Cymbalta, and I got to the point where I wasn't on it for very long and I realized that it was not good for me and I wanted to come off it and I did it on my own and I didn't do it well. I, I did a, I botched it and I have never felt that sick in my life. I literally felt like I was, I was going to die. 
So why is it so difficult to come off these drugs and, and what can we do about it? How do you help people with that? Yeah. Well, first of all, it is not taught in medical school or residency about medication withdrawal. So this is, this is, it sounds really insane that a whole set of physicians would be on, they would be illiterate when it comes to medication withdrawal. So they'll put you on medications and they believe in their, in their mind that they can just lower it later and that there will be no consequences. We know that that's not true. The, doc the doctors are just ignoring that because I think the patients have said over and over again, they've shown through evidence that the withdrawals from these medications are very rough, very tough, very hard to get through. But the doctors don't want to believe it because this is, they've spent, imagine spending 10 years of your life paying for your medical training. This is what is being taught to you as the first line, best form of treatment what are you going to do? Are you going to listen to someone tell you that this medication that you're trained to provide and prescribe and is your sole source of income is not actually the best treatment? I mean, this is going to be really hard pill to swallow for any doctor. So, but the fact is medication withdrawal is difficult from any of these psych meds and it requires skill. And like you, I first learned that hard lesson when I tried to come off of half of a starting dose of Zoloft, which is an SSRI. And that happened in the 1990s. Um, I was put on the Zoloft because I didn't like psychiatry. I was going to uh, go and do something else fun. And they put me on an SSRI because I was depressed in my psychiatry training program. Okay. So then they left me on the medication for five years. I was on half of a starting dose of Zoloft. I, I said to myself as a psychiatrist, it's a very small dose. I'm just going to stop it. And the withdrawals were horrific. It, I, I have it in my YouTube channel. I talk about that a whole experience uh, um, in some of my podcasts. So I don't want to repeat that. But like you, I experienced firsthand that there is indeed very serious withdrawals that happen with these medications. And that switched my mindset. And I started to be much more open, but it wasn't until 2002 when I found tools to help my patients that I was able to do something about it. Because up until then, I was very isolated. I didn't know that there were, you know, actual, you know, different routes to treating mental health. So, so first of all, for people to understand, this is a medication that may be impossible to come off of after you've been on it for a few years. But the complexity of the withdrawal process, sometimes for a lot of these different meds, including benzodiazepines that are helpful for anxiety, like Ativan, um, Klonopin that are you know used a lot, or antipsychotics that are used for psychosis. All of these medications, I would just say, required me to learn three fields, psychiatry, functional medicine, and energy medicine, in order to help these individuals come off of them safely. Um, but there are two main things that affect how difficult these medications are to come off. Number one is the way the body adapts to make room for these medications. Okay, so anything that the medication does to the body, the body has to adapt to make room for it. So when you lower it, the body is going to say, where's the meds? You know, I've made this perfect adjustment for this med. So it's still waiting a year or two down the road. Where's the medication? Until you can use energy medicine to reinform the body. Hey, we're going to be doing this and we're going to be lowering the med. But the second main thing that's really difficult about medication withdrawal is medications are, they're patented unique molecules. They're not like food. They're not food. They're not natural. They're not plant-based. And therefore the immune system is going to look upon it as a foreign substance and the immune system will become hypersensitized to the medication. Now the medication is bound to a receptor. So it's think about this as the, you know, receptor. Think of this at the med, as a medication. It's bound to a receptor, sometimes very, very tightly. So if the immune system is going to attack the medication over and over again, over the years, it can also start to get confused with that receptor. 
It can get confused with the other neurotransmitter that's a natural neuro neurotransmitter on that receptor. And not only the reuptake pump, but right next to it is a re another receptor, not just the reuptake pump, but another receptor close by, even though there's a synaptic cleft between the two nerve cells. So the immune system is really busy cleaning up the mess from the medications that are foreign substances. So the second factor that makes it so difficult to come off these medications is that over the years, the immune system can get hypersensitized, not only to the medication, which it can do very quickly, but to your own neurotransmitters, your receptors, your reuptake pumps, um, you, you know, and the receptor to it. So imagine an immune system that is now hypersensitized to you. And you can't do without neurotransmitters or the receptors or reuptake pumps. So it kind of gets out of control because now your immune system is literally like vaccinated against your own neurotransmitter system. And that can cause a lot of inflammation. Inflammation, once it's embedded in the immune system, I believe the best tool for um, healing that and correcting it is energy medicine. You know, you can't throw a supplement at the body and tell the immune system, oh, now you have vitamin C, so you can stop attacking that medication or the body's own neurotransmitter system because it's already been created by the medication. So these are very complex consequences that happen and evolve over time. So nothing is state static. Nothing is just like, oh, the moment you take the medication, it has the same result the moment you took it as five years down the road. And that's the very, very kind of very static picture that a lot of doctors have. Um, they don't think of the body as a dynamically changing system that will shift and become less amenable to, to having that medication work for you five years down the road. So, and then by then, you know, it's going to be really hard to come off the medication. So you need someone who has really spent a lot of time learning about it. And the, the traditional conventional psychiatrist will simply say, lower your medication slowly. They don't even know what that means to lower it slowly. They don't provide any nutritional support. They don't do any kind of trauma work. I mean, there's nothing other than just lower the medication slowly. They don't recognize the relapse that happens as a combination of untreated underlying causes and withdrawal symptoms three months down the road. Because they expect that once the medication leaves the body and if you're still standing on your two feet, and you're thinking clearly, the withdrawal is done. But that's like saying, okay, you were stabbed in, a, in an alley by this you know, thief. The stabbing is done, so you shouldn't be hurting anymore. You know, that doesn't make sense because once the stab is done, you still have a cut there that needs to be healed. So I think of withdrawal as not just the stabbing event, but the actual healing process that has to heal that scar once you've been stabbed, right? But most doctors will say, oh, it can't be the withdrawal. It's left your body like a week ago. Doesn't make sense, right? Right. Her, I've heard that one many times. Um, that was really fascinating. And I, I never really thought through the, there's an actual autoimmune process happening where the body's attacking its neurotransmitters. I don't think it's recognized as, you know, there's no diagnosis that, that um, is recognized. And one of the things that, that I do with, with autoimmune conditions, which um, may be helpful, and I'm going to actually experiment with this, is I use a type of supplement called a protomorphogen. And these are substances that act as decoys to the immune system. So if somebody, let's say, has autoimmune disease in their thyroid, there's a thyroid protomorphogen that takes the immune system's attention off the thyroid. So you can go in and do some repair work there. But there's also one for the nervous system called neurotrophin. And I'm just really curious about maybe looking a little more deeply into that as one of the um, one of the many things that could contribute to helping people with the withdrawal process and the repair process really is 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 what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. 
So what are what uh what are the symptoms that people have with withdrawal? I know that I felt um I was having electrical zap like feelings in my brain every time I would um uh, looks up, turn my eyeballs back and forth. It was just um, scary. It felt like a, an electric shock in my brain. I I had um, I was bedridden for about a week. I couldn't get out of bed. I was I just I muscled my way through it. I was determined to to do it on my own. Um, what are some of the other symptoms that people experience? I think that. The simplest way to say um, or to help explain medication withdrawals is that you <clears throat> you will generally um, have symptoms that are the opposite of what that medication is supposed to treat. Mm. Okay. So if if that medication treats psychosis, you, you're more vulnerable to psychosis down the road. If that medication is an anticonvulsant, you're much more likely to have mood swings down the road. Uh, if that medication is for depression and anxiety, you'll have more depression and anxiety. But it's not just the old symptoms. It will be magnified. So let's say your symptoms was 1X when you first started the medication. It was uncomfortable enough that you agree to be on medication. When you try to withdraw from the medication, it would probably feel like 10X or 50X. It would be much, much more pronounced, much, much more uncomfortable. Um one of the quickest ways to stop the withdrawal, if you haven't developed a hypersensitivity reaction to the medication already, is to just simply go back up to the dosage that you need of the medication. Find a doctor who can help you heal for a while before lowering the medication. Because when people white knuckle it, what I think is happening is that your body's giving you lots of signals that it's not doing well, physiologically, metabolically, those zaps are very common side effects of coming off of SSRIs. In fact, I think I took a, the SSRI Zola for only one week. I felt better. Maybe by week two, I was, I stopped it and I had zaps. So the zaps can happen like very early on in the treatment. The, the psychiatrist was treating me and gave me the medication. He didn't recognize it as a withdrawal side effect. So, you know, um, now, in terms of um, you know, white knuckling it, the reason why I don't recommend that is because um, the functions uh, that these medications are supporting are going to collapse when you stop these medications. So let's say if you have a SNRI or SSRI, a lot of it is working on the serotonin system. And so if the serotonin system is collapsing in the gut, they're not going to be able to absorb or digest or have the gut function properly during that period of time. And if I were to say to you something like, um, I want you to only eat 1% of what you're eating now for the next two weeks, how well will you do two weeks from now? Not well, right? Right. Because of the impact of how nutrition has been altered in your body. And it has, when we stop these medications, it has consequences, it has ramifications. And so if your GI system doesn't work well, you know, your sleep doesn't work well, so sleep is when most people are detoxing. It's a time when the body is rejuvenating. So let's say you can't sleep because you don't have enough serotonin, you're not converting it to melatonin. How well is your body detoxing? And so now your body's swimming in a lot of toxins. The GI system is not working quite as well. Then it kind of like escalates into more and more difficulties. The same thing goes with benzodiazepines. You know, it's people kind of come off their benzos thinking that they can come off easily. And they can end up being bed bound, you know, and yeah. just not be able to function because the benzos ultimately have an effect on your adrenals. You know, if you don't have enough GABA, you know, GABA neurotransmitters, your body goes into a state of alarm all the time, anxiety, and your adrenals are going to get exhausted, shouting help, help, help all the time inside your body. So you can get exhausted and be, end up being bed bound. So all of these are actual physiological consequences of coming off a medication that your body has made room for. So the main thing that I tell people, if they were to do it right, is you come see a doctor who is experienced, you have to give yourself time to heal. Do you give yourself time nutritionally and energy medicine, you know, intervention to heal from traumas, blockages, blah, blah, blah. There's 
usually, you know, give yourself a month or two months to just get your body ready. And then as your body is ready, uh, a doctor who has the ability to know and gather data to know when you're ready to lower it and by how much, will be able to gradually lower it. And you can literally lower these medications appropriately um, without any withdrawal side effects if you do it right. And be able to watch it. You know, I would. I always tell my patients, you know, three months from the time you get off the medication to three months, that's a time when you're still healing. And it's very important for us to continue to help support you so that you don't have any kind of like possibility of a relapse because these relapses can happen months after you stop taking your medication. Yeah, I've um, seen it happen more than months. I saw it happen a year later with one of my patients. So, yeah. I um I usually prepare the patient's body for up to three months before they start the weaning process. And let's talk about um, how to support the body. Well, first of all, the good news is that if you do have depression or anxiety or other mental health um, symptoms, you can get better without needing these drugs. But yes. but either way. Um, whether you're going to wean off them and then heal yourself, or you're going to try to avoid taking them and, and help yourself get better. There are some very similar nutritional needs that will, that the body will have um, because nutritional deficiencies and imbalances greatly contribute to these types of symptoms. So just in a, just a, in a, in a very general way, I mean, I always promote the eating a clean nutrient dense diet, no matter what, no matter what symptoms you might be dealing with. But I, I have found that many people with mental health symptoms are deficient in good quality fats and keeping in mind that your brain is mostly fat and, um, and also minerals. Um, right. And many, many people, especially in the U.S., but in other parts of the world, too, are deficient in minerals. And the combination of fat and mineral deficiency can cause symptoms like anxiety, depression, insomnia, difficulty handling stress, which leads to those symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so those are those are always going to be a starting point for me is, is good quality fat and good quality minerals. Yeah, I think I agree 100%. Um, I think people don't understand the power of nutrition. You know, uh, when I started learning about, you know, functional medicine, orthomolecular medicine, I learned how, you know, just one mineral can improve so many different enzymes and their efficiency, just one mineral. It does also bring up the point of how um, agriculture is, has shifted over the years. Because one of the um, books that I read along the way on minerals um, and nutrition um, said that in 1917, the iron content of an apple was equal to 26 apples in 1997. So there's no way a person can eat enough nowadays to match their nutrient needs. And that's exactly. where this is very helpful. Yeah. Um, but people, um, well, one of the things I wanted to mention is that there was a book called The Silent Epidemic and mental illness was going up like this in a kind of hyperbolic curve, but so is obesity. So obesity and mental illness, they follow a, simper, uh, a similar hyperbolic curve. And because the two are very much interrelated, right? Um, so um, when you're using one medication or even 10 medications, it cannot replace your body's innate need for minerals and the enzymes that they foster and make more efficient. Um, one, you can, if you have a child who's 12 years old, they could have two years of depression, be suicidal, come in, and if you give them nutrient dense support, I've had those individuals be cleared of depression within two weeks. So you can stretch it to four weeks of treatment if you want to, but they're going to feel so much better when their body is um, fed. Also, there's a lot of genetic problems out there. Um, nowadays, we know about methylation issues that cause problems with detoxification. 
a lot of these good nutritional supplements kind of help you kind of navigate that so you don't have to struggle with some of the consequences of some of these genetic problems. Um, and it it's almost like making sure that you're playing on the same level field with everybody else. You know, other people are kind of detoxing under stress at a pretty rapid pace, but if you have one of those genes, you can't keep up. So stress is going to be a very big underlying factor why some of these individuals will get sick because the way I teach them is that when you're under stress, it's like your factory is working faster. And if your factory is working faster, it's going to release more toxins and waste products. So you have to keep up with detoxification. The only other thing you mentioned was nutrients. Um, there are eight categories that I pay attention to. Um, vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, amino acids, GI support, antioxidants, and anti-inflammatories. Um, so these seven areas, anti-inflammatories and detoxification. So eight areas. So all of these different areas, if you can uniquely tailor these areas to individuals and help them to overcome whatever it is that they're going through, um, they will heal in ways that will really astonish people. You know, like it astonished me as a doctor of many years because I was a conventional psychiatrist for eight years. Um, and when I saw how quickly nutrients can help fix a problem, like for example, people don't know this, but when I was a very young holistic psychiatrist, I saw a person with psychosis who didn't want to take medication, go from feeling kind of suicidal and really kind of, you know, like, his mind wasn't working well, but he was really clear about not taking medication. He got better in two weeks. Like he went from psychotic to being well and having a job in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So people don't understand that nutrients are really very powerful and they work very quickly. They think, you know, if you just use nutrients or supplements that it's going to take longer to heal than medication, but it's not true. I've seen that, um, even a, as a novice in this field, you can do a lot of good just by feeding the body. And that's especially true if you're nutritionally deficient because the you cannot get better if you have nutritional deficiencies. So the saying that you are what you eat is actually true. And um, if you're eating a lot of garbage and chemicals, you have nutritional deficiencies. And a lot of by the way, we didn't mention this, a lot of the chemicals that are added to processed foods are actually neurotoxins that can cause mental health symptoms. Um, two off the top of my head, monosodium glutamate, MSG is a neurotoxin, and so is um, aspartame, which is an artificial sweetener. So <laughs> aside from the fact that added, a lot of these additives cause cancer, they also can cause neurological damage. Well, so, let's talk about yeah. a, a common patient that we just shared recently who had been taking Pepsid for seven years. Mm, right. Why don't you share a little bit about um, how that introduces a problem with uh, nutritional interventions? Yeah. So medications that suppress your stomach acid, the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. So many people have symptoms of reflux and and heartburn and they like you mentioned taking um, antidepressants like candy um, many people take these um, antacids or acid um, inhibitors like candy um, without any thought to the consequences of it but if you do not have appropriate hydrochloric acid in your stomach you cannot digest your nutrients period you cannot break down the uh the the nutrients in the food that you're eating and you will become nutritionally deficient which can lead to mental health symptoms and eventually dementia so mm -hmm. this is a very very common issue that we run into and so many so many people are on these drugs so yeah when when uh if you are on um, a medication like that if you are suffering from indigestion uh, reach out to me because that's that's something that's fairly easy to fix 
and I, I do it every day. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's really important for people to consider the consequences of medications that are supposed to quote, fix a problem because sometimes these medications result in side effects. Then you need another medication to fix that problem. And then you need another medication to fix that problem. Right. And pretty soon you you're on like seven different medications, all of which are treating side effects of the first medication, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to understand that um, holistic clinicians such as you and I have actually holistic options that won't lead to more and more medications. That won't hurt you in the process of helping you. Exactly. That, that's how I describe it. Well, this has been amazing. I want to thank you so much for your time. I hope this was helpful to everyone listening. If you would like to reach out to Dr. Lee, she does have a website, holisticpsychiatrist.com. We'll put a link to that in the description of this video. You can also follow her on her podcast, The Holistic Psychiatrist, which is wonderful. She has so many great um, guests on there as well. And if you need help with an, uh, going on a natural health improvement program, I'm always available. You can email me at questions at drcorey.com or go on my website, drcorey.com. And um, I hope that this was helpful and you'll hit the like button if you liked it so more people can find it. And don't forget to share this video with anyone that you know that you think would benefit from the information. Thank you again so much, Dr. Lee, for your time. And until I see you all again, please stay healthy.